everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ray, I'm a program assistant at the Fine Arts Center, and we're so happy that you're all here this evening. Uh, most of you are here because you're participating in a workshop, but if you're not, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, every summer, the Fine Arts Work Center hosts a week-long open enrollment visual arts and writing workshops for nine weeks, uh, and they're really amazing. tell you more about it or David who's the summer program director uh, can also give you info. Um, favorite parts of the summer programs is that every week our world-class faculty mesmerizes our audiences with presentations and talks. <laughs> Three faculty members, Joan Navayuk Kane and artist Mark Adams. Pam and Joan will both read from their books, and Mark will make a presentation about his work. Then we will have a Q&A with the audience. Uh, before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping and other items of interest. Uh, books will come to the room, uh, and they'll be signing their books after the event. Uh, and books by other faculty, of the summer program faculty, are also for sale uh, in the bookstore, so feel free to check that out. Our new Hudson D. Walker Gallery will be open after the event. Uh, we have an amazing exhibition right now called Density's Glitch, and it's curated by uh, former Work Center fellows, and all the artists in the exhibition are Work Center fellows. Um, and the proceeds of all work sold go to the programs at the Fine Arts Work Center. Uh, a big shout out to East End Books, who helps us stock our bookstore. Restrooms are located down the hall. That and finally, uh, turn your cell phones to silent. Okay, we're gonna start with writer Pam Houston, a longtime member of the Fox Summer faculty who's teaching a course this week called In Defense of All Pam and more recently, Airmail Letters of Politics, Pandemics, and Place, co-authored with Amy Irvine also the author of Cowboys Are My Weakness, Contents May Have Shifted, and four other books of fiction and nonfiction. She lives at 9,000 feet above sea level on a 120-acre waters of the Rio Grande. She raises Icelandic sheep and Irish ones and is a fierce advocate. Readers of her work admire and applaud the deep passion and admiration for the natural present throughout her body of work and Kirkus Reviews described her memoir Mill Creek as an inspiring love letter to one piece of earth and to the rest of it as well. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Pam Houston. And for keeping this thing going, even through uncertain times, I'm really thrilled to present tonight with Mark and also with Joan Kane, whose work is very, very important to me and to the earth. Um, so I'm going to read two. They've both been Deep Creek. Um, they were both written on the written for an anthology with Stranger, and the second was written in an anthology called Alone Together, which was to raise money for bookstores during, uh, during the COVID shutdown. Um, so I'll begin with Letter to a Stranger. Dear 20-something German woman who was helping the Icelanders bring the sheep down the north tier. You will pardon my terrible pronunciation of all Icelandic words. There are many. <laughs> To begin, I must admit, is my forward American woman who visited Iceland, and I happened when you and the men came riding down the dirt track in the North Valley, pushing ahead of you 1,500 sheep. You had come all the way from of more than 20 kilometers, gathering sheep from the highlands along the east side of the Jokulsa River. 
I was on foot when you arrived, high up on the side of the hill, helping you together with their sheepdogs were pushing the sheep you were driving down along that final fence, the ones with the pens at the bottom, where they'd stay overnight, packed in like sardines, and crazy until tomorrow, and you and the others would move them on down valley to the retier. There is no English equivalent for the word retier, because it is both the name of the wheel, made from wood, that holds hundreds of sheep in pie slice compartments, and the name of the yearly event, where farmers sort the sheep into that wheel, one pie slice per farmer. Retirement sheep party, one of the men I followed up the hillside had said. As I watched you dismount, sling your saddle back and place it on the crossbar of a fence for airing, I guess it was your second summer in Iceland, and also that there is a young man waiting for you back in Berlin and will one day. You went home on the 15th of August so the two of you could have a Croatian holiday before you returned university, and when you told him only a few weeks ago that they planned to stay in Iceland until the end of September, till after the secondary retreat, where you and the men pick up all the strays, there was silence on the line for a good 60 seconds before he said he was late to have a beer with his mates. Maybe if you were honest with yourself, you would admit that you miss your Hanoverian gelding till a bright bear withers and a floaty extended more than your code writing. But these Icelandic stocky bodies up and go and their honest, ever expanding heart attention have made you forget a little, even till. This summer when you arrived, the farm took you up to the wild herd and let you choose a four year old geld train up by yourself and you did a flea beaten gray with an unusually dark mane you'd name Naturman, Nader for short, Icelandic for nights. He was a good learner from the start, a horse prone to making the right decision. The trust built between them all summer long, but never the gathering, melting down the high sides of the valley shoulder to shoulder with a dozen men through the stage on horses they halter broke before the turn of the century. Nader followed those tried and true horses over ancient lava flows, leaping downhill over glacial erratics, dodging holes with a kind of intuition you'd never seen before holes that would have snapped Till's long legs like matchsticks. Together you were tireless, up and down the valley wall, finding the strays and loners who hid in the bags and steeps, or one the top and into the high, never survived the winter. Or never shied, not when a particular giant you mock charged him, not even when the caribou yearling likely abandoned by his mother and hanging with the ewes and lambs for the summer, came galumphing down the hill beside that wherever those sheep were going, he was going to. Don't think it hasn't occurred to you to put Nader on a boat and take him back to Berlin and straight into endurance. But then you think about the long, hot German summer, the stall he'd be forced to stand in every day, and how even if you could find a turnout situation, he'd never graze again along a glacial-fed river or fill his lungs with this crystal or doze under the northern lights, his legs tucked under him like a as you ate the bread and apples the farmer's wife brought out, as you took the mandatory shot of Brennevin, you kept your eyes on Nate, <coughs> checking for lameness, making sure he was cooled. You were up and moving toward the sheep pen, the first one over the fence, shush, shush, shushing them toward the chute, moving half to the lower pen so they would have a place to lie down tonight, enough room to turn around. Panicked lambs bleated for ewes and vice and you moved with the wave of them, advancing and receding, resisting and capitulating. You knew some half of these lambs would go to slaughter, but not tonight, not tomorrow. This is how the world about four solid months of bliss up in the highlands, and then everything changes. You too were dreaming. the air in the pen prickled with the change. Even the men who'd been so cool all day, who wouldn't answer any of your questions except in I simultaneously chaffed and impressed that a girl could keep up, could hang in, could not lose her seat or her temper or her mind going up and down those steeps all day. Just you and Nader, one body, your bodies, food for being safe for the winter or less the next spring, even scared and impatient, not you. No, you had burnished rose in your cheeks, the pure joy that came with 
examples of hard riding and wild and clean terrain with a job well done in a centuries old tradition that by some twist of fate you to fully participate in this country that sits in the place where the North American tectonic plate are at the centimeters per year. There you were saying shush, shush to those sheep in the pet human being as I have seen. You had a star inside your chest and it was glowing like a supernova. Your heart had exploded to the size of an Icelandic horse's named after the night sky or a spring lambs set out to with her twin sister and her mom the whole summer ahead to look forward to. I am because you may not have known how wondrous you were in that moment. My hope is that you will take that day into consideration as you make decisions about Pam Houston. <clears throat> Thank you. And this is called Stamina, which I said is a word I was given. It's called Stamina Memorial Day Weekend 2020. A lamb was born here on Saturday, a little ram. And when I say little, I mean it. He was a preemie, born late in the spring, conceived a month end of mating season. The last thing we need around here is another ram. We have two already, and though they are best friends, they spend most of their time with the top of their heads grotesquely bloodied, suggests. Sometimes for fun, they ram me, taking me down from which are any firm, the wild of the domestic breeds. The rams have large circular holes, big enough to do some damage. My Icelandic mountain lion, and though some of them lost the battle, some of them, including Elsie, the mother of this little preemie, won, which is alive to birth another ram, which, as I mentioned, is the last thing we need. The ewes who protect from predators, while the rams, the ones with the cower in the back. It is also the ewes who protect their babies from the very rams who provided them that created them. I have seen a ram toss a newborn into the minutes after birth. Luckily, lambs bounce. The rancher the boy in order to petition, but I have seen a ram a tiny mule and I, as I was running to get them separated, I have seen the five postpartum you pin that ram, who weighs a third again as she does, to the ground. Saturday's lamb was the tiniest ever, a little listless, not eager to nurse. Icelandics always give birth to the on his feet and well fed. Over the course of the long, afternoon, I prompted the little ram to nurse successfully at least twice, but Elsie wasn't doing much to encourage him, which made me think she had already given him up for dead. There is always the thought when a ewe shows little interest <coughs> that you might know the lamb has some genetic or that one of his internal systems isn't right. I live at high altitude, so even this far into May, the temperature was forecast to dip into the low 20s. After nightfall, Elsie wasn't even trying to keep the little ram warm and was too out of it to seek comfort himself. I bundled up in my fleece-lined pants, my down parka, and wool hat to sleep in the barn with Elsie and her baby. Why didn't I take the baby into the warm house with me? I was still hoping Elsie wouldn't reject him outright. A lot of fun, but they rarely get the nutrition and antibodies they need to thrive to their fullest capacity. What you learn on a ranch and there are few things in the world sweeter than the tight, tight curls of a newborn Icelandic sheep or the warm breath that rises up and out of him or when he licks with his tiny pink tongue. A year from now, should this baby live, he will be big and strong enough to break my kneecaps. But this summer, he will bound around the pasture chasing butterflies, buying his sweet high-pitched ba, and tumbling through with his older girl cousins. Most of my have already gone too trying to save him, that I always let nature take its course. I'm not a rancher. I am a writer, a teacher, a progressive, an activist, a woman who 
this Icelandic sheep and names them. COVID has kept me home for three solid months and connected me more intensely than animal sleeping in the bedded down away from the lamb and I lowered myself to the ground with my back against a haystack and pulled the baby into my lap. He snuggled into my down jacket, making it up. I let him, but then I stand there staring at the wall, swaying. So I would scoop him back up and he head down again. At first light, I got him a little, but Elsie wouldn't stand still long enough for him to get much milk. By 8 a.m., he had lost the use of his back leg, shaking, no matter sign he was starving to death. There is no substitute for authentic used milk, but I went to the house and mixed up some save a lamb milk replacer. The baby was too weak to suck, too weak by then to care, so I force fed him, not with a tube, just with I forced the nipple and rubbed his throat to make him swallow and didn't let him out of my lap until of the milk was gone. With newborns, if you're going to see milk replacing much. He had stopped shaking, but his eyes were dull, and he was still unwilling to stand. By that time, I decided if he was going to die, I could give him some comfort. I rocked him and kissed his lanolin-smelling head ends of horn. He weighed, it seemed, almost nothing. Elsie watched a little coldly, I thought, from her corner of the enclosure. What do you know that I don't, I asked her, but she just chewed her cud. I didn't know what was wrong with the little ram, but I did know that 100,000 Americans would be dead from COVID by the end of the week. I knew the real number was actually higher because several states, Florida, Georgia, Texas, had been cooking their COVID books. I knew the vast majority of the dead, grandmothers and grandfathers, husbands and wives, doctors and nurses, daughters and sons, had died without their loved ones there beside them. And I knew tens of thousands of those deaths were unnecessary, due only to the colossal failure, perhaps intentional, of the Trump administration and its enablers in the GOP. I knew that our government was being intentionally dismantled from within. I knew that by virtue of being an outspoken woman, I was no longer safe here at my beloved ranch, and I also knew that on the scale of who is and who is not safe in this country, I fared infinitely better than most. I knew that it was long past time for those selfish men to relinquish control of the country into the hands of women. I knew that it was time for women to step into the power that they had been gaslighted out of believing was theirs all along. I knew I had some role in that, that perhaps we all did, I knew I needed to figure out what it was. I spent all day Sunday in the barn and force fed that little ram six more times, two ounces every two hours. He got so sick of me shoving the rubber nipple into his mouth that the seventh time he got up, bobbed and weaved over to Elsie and started nursing. I, was, I spent Sunday night in the barn too, but by then he was toddling around again and Elsie was showing a bit more interest. Mostly he slept curled up against her, coming over to sniff at me once an hour or so, maybe making sure I was warm enough. By Monday morning, it seemed for the first time the little ram might make it. Before the day was over, a Minneapolis policeman named Derek Chauvin would kneel on the neck of George Floyd for eight minutes, killing him. When I was a little girl, my father broke many things that belonged to me, my femur and my hymen to name the two most significant. He crumpled 16 of his cars around my body and his own, driving drunk and careless and angry. Then there was psychological torture. See any Trump tweet of the last 72 hours, of any 72 hours, which I still insist was the worst torture of all. Surviving my father's house took hypervigilance, wiliness, the ability to separate my mind from whatever was being done to my body. Most of all, it took stamina, 17 years of it. The beat always in my head saying, keep your eyes open, plan for the worst case scenario, stay alive at any cost, survive long enough to get out. By first light on Tuesday, the little ram's legs worked perfectly. I spent parts of the next days and nights in the barn and then it warmed up enough to send me back to my own bed. Now he's a week old, 
skipping across the outdoor enclosure, bouncing off the walls of the stall, crawling all over Elsie, and ramming the holy hell out of the water trough. He weighs four times what he did last Saturday, and when I lift him, I feel his warm, rounded belly full. The milk replacer is closed up and put away for next year, and even now, every time he sees me, he runs straight over to Elsie to nurse. <laughs> I am not any sort of hero. I saved the ram because I thought maybe I could. I saved him because none of my heartfelt writing, nor my activism, nor my passionate progressive values could save George Floyd. I saved him because cities are burning all across my country, and a man I can't keep straight or from my dead father promised to do this to us, and now he is doing it every day. I saved him to mitigate, if slightly, the wave of grief that is raining down on us, to prove to myself that I have both the strength and the stamina to save at least one small, fragile thing. I left my father's house when I was 17. Did not expect to find myself at 58 back in it, along with my 330 million brothers and sisters. To beat COVID, to beat these goons whose end game is always cruelty for cruelty, we are going to have to play the long game, all of us together, even if the men with the horns cower in the back. I can't run quite as fast as I used to, nor kick quite as hard, but what I haven't lost over the decades is stamina. Sleeping in the barn for a week to save a lamb whose mother left it for dead may not sound like much, but my mother left me for dead too, so often in my father's bed, and now you ought to see how I can ram a water trough. You ought to see how I still bounce. Elsie looks at me with a little more respect these days than she used to. In the wilds of Iceland, she might have had to abandon that baby, but here she has a barn and a woman just tenacious enough to believe she can save anything. Maybe some lives. Maybe democracy. This morning, and only this morning, I named the little ram Tank. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. That was wonderful. Now we're going to hear from writer Joan Navayuk Kane, a new member of the Fine Arts Work Center summer faculty, who's teaching a workshop called Trouble in Mind. Joan is a Nupek with family from Uyu and Quarek. The author of eight collections of poetry and prose, she's a lecturer uh, in the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts, and teaches creative writing at Harvard, Tufts, and the Institute of American Indian Arts. She raises her sons in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The LA Review praises her poetry's keen awareness of the natural world and intense desire to belong within this world and notes that her poems draw out a sustained vision of how to piece together a life sensory and ever present in unfolding love and loss. Fans of her work love the attention to detail and quality of her poetry's voice, even describing her work as a voice from deep within us. Please join me in giving a big warm welcome to Joan. Mic check, sorry. Is that good? Oh, I hate microphones. Oh, <laughs> right there. Um, it's not going away either. It's going to be there until I'm done. Um, it's going to outlast me. Okay, I'm not going to extemporize. Um, I'm called by my namesake, Nevayuk, and my ancestors and my children and I share our homes of King Island and Mary's Igloo. Um, here we go. Let's get this over with. <laughs> Cutting the river. I woke up like this on the shore of a snow beaten sea during the dark part of a day that will darken like the others into the dark winter. 
when the tragic figure thinks of death, he thinks of me. In this way, I become at last another bright departure. Hot loss and yet high fed, witness the mountain I make of his grass widow before her middle, too, is worn away with reckless weather. Rehearsal for surveying the ruins. Unable to construct a more compassionate narrative, I have drowned and turned back into myself. Pity this, pop my pee, sorry, pity this. Traveling north against the waves. If at the end I remain paper thin, I do not want to hear ceaselessly of it. I no longer circle the graves of the dead, the ones who exact so much from the living. Beneath a birch whose limbs had grown too large, I left eleven lanieries and poppies gone to seed. Some objects I slipped from their brackets, others we concealed from all seers, save the skulk of polar foxes in their blue morph, who may soon inhabit what yet stands of the house as we abandoned it. Let us thwart of emptiness and suppose a deaccessioned hawk and handsaw through the scuttle, for I had. I had and would have had again. I'm gonna extemporize for a second. Um, Cause I um, had um, a long COVID complication last October. I was on my way to teach a long day and I was walking to the T and I slipped and oh, I thought I slipped and fell, but really I just remember like thinking, oh, I'm falling. I better like before this gets ugly. And I got up and I picked out the seven of my teeth, um, one through my upper lip, this one, <laughs> um, and um, also fractured my wrist and I massively concussed. Anyway, so I'm kind of like, I like it's hard for me to read some of these poems because I wrote them before this happened and I'm like, I can't make sounds <laughs> anymore with my smashed lip. Um, <laughs> so, okay, that was enough. Here's a poem that is, um <laughs> here's a poem that um, is actually has a lot to do with Alice Oswald and um, stuff. So that's where the last two lines come from. They're hers. Um, and yeah, she writes with the fox pelt from Ted's hanging from the rafters above her desk. And so this poem is called Upon Learning. She's hung a fox pelt. Not an easy thing to shake as she defers her rapprochement with Apoidea over false oxlip and flocks. A glacier makes a river of ice, of earth, of everything that is and is not she. A paradox. The present is a dark text to return into. She strikes the bright inscriptions which might yet teach for a long time. We tread the paths of myth grown sick like the boy who banged in ads until it grew dull and the snow ceased. And like that which presupposes and us line, image, lilt. I am not quite myself in other declarations. I do not exalt with great nimbleness and did not notice the lemming as he slipped through a hole in the fenestra on some annual migration to the sea, past himself as his own pelt monger and far past the point where he pulled an awl through the plow seas. In these words, at times within the old enchantment, one broods beyond the problem of being bound to place to anything at all. And then the ballista too becomes its own source of wonder. An omen, albeit one tempered by the concise splendor of a mind as it moves quick, unsick within the confines of night. Breach, lyric, split time. Will she? She will. Explicate the fixed architecture as it flickers by trying over and over its broken line. Trying over. Um, I'm getting there. I'm almost done. Um, I'm going to skip a few too, because whatever. Um, okay, this is, um, uh, I feel bad reading this um, a bit. My mom had two massive strokes on Saturday, um, so um, I'm going to read this poem anyway. The Gray Eraser. There was no one to scold, 
even when the heavens seem the most abject of failures receptive to correction. Likewise, in tackleless sleep, the magpies remain tucked away. A mother can no longer dismiss her child as a spectacular waste of an education. Even the wind stills its sighs in the dry and bare branches of the nearby white spruce damaged by virulent blight. Meanwhile, a pearl green fox retracts its untrust tail through an eastward sky thick with unfamiliar stars. If I wake missing the cold, fresh sound of the new snow, I may still miss the kinds of places that scar me and complete my sorrow. Late at night, the birches let their leaves pitch and imbricate the floor of what is left of the woods near what is left of the um, Okay, here's a really cheerful one. <laughs> Field work. Another day of heat, strangers continue to wobble across the horizon, bringing drought when instead we should have deluge. I steep snow lichen in water I drew from a lake which has since gone dry. At sea, few understood me as though I had a sickness that deafened, then healed. As before, I predict lies to be pushed from the boat time and time again. Nevertheless, I expect to get by when widowers seek refuge with their provident families. Perhaps a storm will pile fish at their doors when the red tide rises. Perhaps they will not follow as we move moon into moon under another sky. Um, none of my exes are watching this on the internet and um, enjoying that I'm reading these hateful poems about them. <laughs> Actually, whatever. Fuck, fuck these guys. <laughs> all right. I mean, all right. Um, okay. Som sometimes, this, this is called, sometimes there are even scars. Um, you know, you can laugh out loud when I'm reading. It's fine. I'm just kidding. Don't. Well, whatever. Do what you need to do to get through it. Um, sometimes there are even scars. In waking night after night, in an apartment parched, I look out the window into the dark for some glimpse of what I've lost. An ocean that held so many boats built by men, now dead. Numerous windings through scree to crown, driveline, cairn, blind. I see nothing but the sky. Sometimes Stars as bright as collarbones gleam before I blink, then find these firmaments also disappeared. Other nights, something Atlantic heaves with rain. When the storm lifts away, perhaps it will have left gaffed fish circling for a child and another child to find. Perhaps I will no longer fight the mind that might hold but one swan, one hair, one figure. Perhaps I will not begin to cry because of the way in which I mark the months as they accumulate and fall away. No blood, no certainty. I might yet reek of burnt things. My skirts may carry their stained past trap after deadfall trap, the burren coffle of dog hitched to dogs, hitched to a lading of oil. Cool. I see the light at the end of the tunnel, metaphorically speaking. Um, <laughs> uh, this is dark traffic, dark traffic. In the snows buffer the sound of a voice set forth. I thought her lost already, that she had gone to neglect the late migration. Before it ceases, the ice collapses easily. There is no day without a symptom. Consolation may turn out to be a guttural practice. After all, the small gesture of sound lodged deep before it glides without warning downward. There is nothing but the wind howl and dive where water is thrown over water and to it. A howl and dive of wind, water she found flown over water where once we found ice, where the snow once stuttered the sound of that shouter shouting, this listener. 
holding her head in her hands, the head in its fine blank way and original. Okay, this is my maybe penultimate poem, um, Rookeries. All men knew a secret of the northern part of an old world, a less perfect idea. For the bicornuit woman, it was an island, though its birds we we might learn their language. After all, we had been taught to read and write, to remove our hands from other work as we watch water twist into rock, to cover our wounds, staying alive, light after light. For something I worry. The moon pronounced with clarity its known topography. Our letters and lists, reconstructed grammars, they replaced the ways in which we were grabbed and pushed, then shoved. Set a wife and her children to rove with indefinite orders. Lineal migration on a small scale is not nautical, but conflictual. Of those men, we knew I could never do them any good. This way, I forget and let the wind river. It gales and tears at my shoulders and wrists. Okay, I'm gonna read one last poem. Um, a new poem, newish, it's old to me. New to you, old to me. Um, the font is all messed up and I'm old. I'm gonna try to read it on this little phone. <laughs> Don't run out. Real and white as snow. Have you forgotten the swan crossing with a dark tide southward to the sound? Not too far off, firework and blast of something hard to reach and harder to escape. I remember without you, a woman's quarrel. It passes, quarrel with no one. Thank you so much for listening. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you, Joan. This beautiful work. Finally, we're going to hear from artist Mark Adams. Mark is a veteran member of the Falk Summer Faculty and is teaching a course this week called In the Footsteps of Thoreau, a drawing and writing workshop. Mark is a painter and cartographer showing at the Schoolhouse Gallery in Provincetown with 25 years experience in the National Park Service. He has exhibited installations, prints, photography, scientific illustration, and video art. His retrospective expedition was at the Provincetown Art Association and Museum in 2017. He has traveled with a sketchbook in Asia, Central America, and Europe, and has illustrated and co-authored a geologic primer, Coastal Landforms of Cape Cod, with geologist K G Graham Gies from the Center for Coastal Studies and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. The Schoolhouse Gallery describes his work as being about things that imperfectly represent nature to our society, harvesting curi curiosity, wonderment, and a little biology as source material. Please give a warm Falk welcome to Mark Adams. All right. Thank you, David and Rennie. Thank you, um, all the friends I see in the audience and, uh, and students in my class and the other classes. And it's really humbling to be up here um, with Joan and, um, and with Pam and to hear Allison last night. Um, because one of the things that I'm really passionate about is how to immerse yourself in the natural world and in a knowledge of the world in order to kind of um, I don't know what the right word is, not redeem, but you know, sort of transform ourselves into bigger and better animals in the world. Uh, and uh, um, anyway, I'm being taught all the time by the other people here who are, are doing that so bravely. Um, and I'm gonna talk uh, about some of the things, some of the my professional things that have guided my artistic work, some 
I just think they're interesting, and I hope you do too. <laughs> um, but um, this is adapted from a couple different talks, both about geology and about uh, uh, climate change and migration. And uh, so let's see. And I do owe a, a big debt to the Center for Coastal Studies, Graham Geis, uh, and uh, Mark Borelli, and the National Park Service. Um, so um, I'm really, I'm really uh, uh, kind of obsessed with the Gulf of Maine maps, with seafloor maps. And this is, uh, some of you may be familiar with this from uh, the show at PAM a few years ago. Uh, that's uh, a map of the Gulf of Maine, the, the seafloor. And uh, you'll s you can kind of recognize Cape Cod over on the left and Nova Scotia uh, on the right and George's Bank in the middle. And, uh, um, and then uh, along with this installation, there's a little shed, it's a ship's cabin uh, based on the dimensions of Darwin's cabin from the Beagle uh, when he did his five-year voyage uh, that uh, led to a whole rethinking of, uh, of evolution. Uh, and then inside the, uh, the cabin is a chart table and a, an opportunity to, uh, to sketch and uh, sort of view the rest of the exhibition, including the Tiepolo canoe hanging from the ceiling and various maps and things. Um, uh, again, I'm like striving in ways to put humans into context, both spatially and in time. And um, uh, I also had an opportunity to make another similar map, and it made me think. Uh, it was actually a show about cartography, history of maps uh, in New England, and and uh, um, and we know plenty about the 400-year period of uh, uh, European colonization. Uh, and in this show, we also they also had uh, a retelling from uh, Wampanoag historians of the uh, contact stories, the narratives of from their point of view of how that happened. But what I really wondered about is the the long history of native time and how it overlaps with geology. So, um, and that's you know we know that uh, so the. When there's all these interesting uh, sort of juxtapositions. You know, Cape Cod, New England has a same similar geology to North Africa. To there's Appalachian orogeny in Morocco, and that's because of continental drift, right? And and then uh, we have the that's the hundred million year period, which you could try to wrap your head around that time period. Then there's the the tens of thousands of years, which is glacial time, but it's also human time. Um, and then we know more and more about the colonial period, and now we're kind of in that time of remapping uh, a new century with a whole new set of, uh, of issues and uh, outcomes that are very mysterious. So here's the spreading of the continents, and, uh, and that what that means is that the mid-Atlantic ridge, that, that middle of the ocean, is actually the boundary of North America. Uh, and that's where all the new land is forming as the continents are still drifting apart. Um, and it affects what kind of coast we have here. And then this is a little representation of what Cape Cod and New England might have looked like uh, 22,000 years ago. And then the, the glaciers retreated and left this kind of glacial outwash, finely sorted plains. Uh, notice the stump of Cape Cod. Uh, there's no province town, and that's because that Provincetown belongs to another era of uh, recarving that landform and creating from marine sand and waves uh, as sea level rose. Sea level rose 400, 400 feet in that time period. In the in, in time, you know, human human time, uh, let's say, is somewhere in that twenty thousand year uh, range. So. I wonder what kind of stories are embedded in narr in, in uh, indigenous narratives that tell ab about the life, ways, and experience of that uh, geologic time. You know, let's. Uh, so I made this here uh, on the left, which is full of uh, representations of the Pleistocene megafauna that humans might have encountered when they came here. Uh, those are. Things like mastodons, giant bears, walruses, of course the whales and sharks. But that everything in yellow was dry land, 
when the first humans arrive. You know, we think, you see the continental, but you know, that navigated this, these vast coastal plains, you know, they must have had so that, so uh, that in, in and so here in England and a couple hero giant of uh, wa uh, of Wampanoag culture uh, through the sand and create the water flowing partly because he was mad um, but a metaphor for tell the action along with the exhibits of uh, in the Cape Cod Museum of Art. Um, food sea levels rising is that um, there's that's potential energy that, that sand belongs at the bottom of the cliff. Uh, it's the cycle and that sand then it's feeding, it's moving along the shoreline and creating beaches to the north. So this whole system, it's a river of sand that is, uh, that's, that's nourishing the landscape, even though we have to move things and get out of the way. And uh, now that we are about it, uh, let's see. So yeah, everywhere that you see these spits and things, you moving that direction. So Monomoy Island to the south, Province Sound to the north. <coughs> and just a, a Let's play this out. Every, there's about a wave every six seconds. A square meter of water weighs about a ton. Uh, how much sand can a, a ton of water carry? Uh, well, it's, it varies by, by based on the sand, but we have, there's like 14,000 waves a day, five million a year. So when you're laying on the beach with your book, reading for an hour, there's the equivalent of, uh, well, let's see, we had 150 dumps per day of sand that are constantly moving along the shoreline. Um, and this is kind of one of the concepts behind everything, behind living sustainably with nature, is that nature does work for us. Uh, there's all of this equity in a sustainable natural system. Uh, let's see, so. Yeah, and as I said, you know, we know better now. Uh, we can actually plan um, when to mo when to get rid of the houses on the cliffs? Um, Thoreau, who's sort of like one of the, um, uh, mascots of the class I'm doing this week with his walk around the Cape, he was really kind of a smart guy, um, and he was a surveyor. And he his observations were not informed by all the science we have now, but they were really astute. And what he did is what what I try to do with my uh, sketchbook practice is to just intuit and make sense out of real observations in the world. There's a view that was on some of the early charts from the set from the 18th century of uh, the cliffs of Truro. This is what a sea captain would have seen and had to interpret uh, the shoreline. And so this is Thoreau's era. This is Hopper's era, but it's also Thoreau's era. That's Cornhill and Truro. That's the old South Truro meeting house. And this is the landscape that was there that's celebrated this kind of deserty. Uh, Moore's landscape, and it was actually the most artificial and industrialized landscape in the history of New England. It really was New England wide. And because of things like these salt works, uh, the, uh, the hunger for fuel, for uh, just using resources, uh, for not understanding uh, what was a sustainable level, but also, uh, let's see, and, and you know, and bringing the, 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 the in the life ways of the city to a place like this, and I just love her. <laughs> you know, I'm going to put on my hat and go uh, pet um, And the whalebone arch in the background, uh, uh, what's her name? Be it's it's uh, the pen the daughter of Peniman in East Ham, and that's the Peniman house with the whale jaw uh, gateway. Um, you know, uh, and, and so 
more little piece of statistics. Uh, it took about 40 cords of wood per year for a sustainable European family or, you know, colonist family to live. And, uh, you know, if at, in 1790, if there were so like 800 families, you know, that, that was like, that kind of spelled about 10 years left for the woodland that was left at that time, you know, in Thoreau's time um, to before it was completely denuded. And we have these fantastic um, coastal survey maps that showed what forest was left at the time. As a, as a cartographer, I was able to use these to overlay the, the, the property boundaries and see how those old woodlots fit. You know, they, they've split up the, these long, narrow woodlots because, uh, with poor quality woodland, you needed a big, wide strip to support one house. Uh, you know, basically the wood was mined <laughs> from the backshore forests uh, to support the pattern. So there's the what was left of the woodland in North Truro in uh, 1848, let's say, and uh, and then the the forest grew back, but those boundaries of the forest are still there because all of that clearing and disturbance of the soil layer meant that pines grew back instead of oak. So if you go walking in North Truro, if you go walking in the old King's Highway, you'll see these places where on one side of the road it's all oak and the other side it's all pine. And that dates back, you know, 200 years to how the land was stewarded or not stewarded. Oh, um, and then there's a bunch of other things that you can see from, uh, from the forest, like the uh, multi-branched, multi-trunked oak trees were coppiced, they were, they were, they were cut in part, and uh, and there's a whole like amazing tradition of uh, uh, landscape interpretation that you can. Do. But uh, you know, as uh, what I encourage you to do is just make observations and try to um, come up with a story to explain why, how a place came to be. Um, th this because uh, the other um, factor in the shape of the landscape was the the ro the rolling parabolic dunes of Provincetown. Uh, there was a study that mapped the basically the velocity of these dunes over 300 years. Uh, and what, you know, what they found was that uh, the dunes actually didn't move before they were cleared, before the colonists came. The, the dunes were relatively stable and uh, they, were, they accelerated all through the 1800s and 1900s. Um, and they've now, s vegetation has come back, but there's this character pattern of these, these half mile wide, mile long parabolic forms in the dunes uh, in, in Truro behind um, East Harbor, Pilgrim Lake, and they're fantastic forms. They're, they're, they're like a result of physics, um, but uh, um, they're starting to slow down uh, as far as that. And then and we use uh, wind winds to sort of match that uh, the prevailing wind uh, is the, um, the determinant of the direction of those shapes. Um, so um, let's see. I'm just gonna let's let's run ahead here. <laughs> That's there's a, a lot of I think are interesting, but um, I think that the Cape is actually a really good place to be in, in face of climate change because we have uh, there's a certain lifestyle, a certain attention to uh, local resources. There's abundant groundwater. Uh, we have flooding and storms, but um, New England is is a kind of a sweet spot, and I think with awareness, it's a really place to be as these as the the plant zones march northward and as it, as Massachusetts becomes like North Carolina um, th there were some Harvard students that did an, a plan for Provincetown waterfront in the face of uh, you know five to ten feet of sea level rise and what's one thing that's funny is the picture in the lower left that's kind of what the waterfront looked like in 1850 because every house had a pier, every house had a, had a wharf, and every all of their activity was uh, was faced the harbor and fishing, and uh, uh, that was the lifeway of the time. Uh, it's impossible. Um, so th this is an example of a scientific scientist's notebook, and one of the inspirations for what I do, as far as uh, uh, you know, taking in like. Uh, um, Observations and that include both drawing and writing uh, in the moment um, in the environment. Some of these are a little more planned, and uh, you know when I when the 
the hummingbirds come into my outdoor shower and kind of like hang out in the trumpet vine. And that's a great time of year. Um, squid, squidding off of the pier in Provincetown. Um, now, the, you won't see this here in Cape Cod. <laughs> but uh, there are otters. And when you do get a glimpse of them, you know, just a glimpse is enough to give you the character of the animal. Um, some of my sketchbooks are traveling and uh, I've tried to cultivate this idea of capturing a moment quickly uh, while it's still vital, uh, you know, and obviously <laughs> this is probably not the way that I'd like to see elephants treated, but uh, it's an experience that um, give it. Who was it? Was it um, Allison talking about holding a bird, right? That whole, that, that yeah, 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 the petrels. And, um, and uh, you know, I have to admit that there's something really important and moving about feeling the heartbeat of an animal, of, uh, you know, feeding a, 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 a ram. Uh, I mean, this is, it, it is humanizing in a way. Um, so I'm just going to show a few more pictures. Uh, kind of field sketches, class drawings. Um, I've been drawing on books. Uh, this is from Nick Flynn's memoir, uh, The Ticking of the Bomb. Uh, or on tide charts, uh, travel sketchbook. This is in Morocco, uh, where I was able to work on a crew doing some of that plate tectonics, continental drift work, uh, and Iceland. Um, impossible to capture, but uh, do our best. Uh, and then another um, interest of mine is this, is human migration is a part of our character, a, a part of the human species is the freedom to migrate, the, the life ways uh, of humans that goes back uh, as, you know, to um, uh, all the way back to the beginning of human species, and that is such an essential thing, that freedom to move, the, and it matches, in ecology, there's a system of corridors and refuges that allow animals to survive. You know, we can hem, pen, pin them in with development, with roads, with pavement, but if there's a corridor, if there's a, there's a whole Yellowstone ecosystem that connects ecosystems throughout the West that is uh, really essential, and I think there's a there's a, a kind of a parallel for humans that we need free movement, we need to welcome our neighbors, we need to um, have an open, open borders. Um, it'll enrich us all. And I've made a lot of artwork um, uh, kind of to celebrate that fact. Uh, asylum maps, uh, refuge maps, that are both related to humans and to uh, animals. Um, and uh, I also did some work volunteering with refugees in the Mediterranean, and also did some work raising uh, funds with drawings for uh, the Mexican border. This is a refugee camp in Athens, and I spent some time in uh, Lesbos. Uh, and, you know, uh, okay, so this is a really kind of moving and shocking site. This is on, on Lesbos. This is called the Life Jacket Graveyard, uh, and all of the this is a long journey. I'm not going to um, try to explain it here and now. You know, that gateway to Europe, there's a few gateways to Europe where uh, you can present your asylum claim. People have to be coming, you know, spurred by the Syrian war. Spur there are Kurdish people, Afghans, Syrians, some Africans as well make it through this corridor. Once they get to Lesbos from Turkey, they are um, in Europe and they can legally file an asylum claim and see what the courts do with that. But they drop their cheap life jackets and they get bulldozed into this little landfill. And um, I went there with a few of the refugees and they were like, there's my life jacket, you know. Um, and, uh, and one of the things, you know, I can't tell the stories of these, but working with them, I found that uh, doing portraits, you know, even photography is sort of questionable. But I could do their portrait, and it was a way of uh, shining a spotlight on their identity as people. And so it was one of the, the great things uh, to be able to put in my sketchbook portraits of these people. I kind of um, 
almost choked me up to see them. And, and some of these people are still in touch with on Facebook, and they have moved through the system to into Europe. But you know, it's I mean, it's stunning that that displacement story, where everything that your life is centered around is stripped from you, and your fondest dream is to have a, a tract house in a place where you don't speak the language, where the climate is foreign to you, where the, f the food is maybe uh, distasteful. <laughs> but that's, again, a way to reestablish your home. And think of how many times humans have gone through that, that refugee process in, you know, in over time. Anyway, and you know, so climate change is going to be a big driver. It's I think it will triple the refugee population. There's something like 60 million displaced people in the world right now. And uh, the areas that are soon to be outside of the human niche that it will are sort of cannot sustain human life anymore are also the areas of poverty and oppression in the world. It's a big match. Um, this was on the bulletin board in the uh, refugee uh, center. Um, and Again, um, just I want to make work that celebrates immersion into nature, and uh, oh, okay, I think well. So I'm I'm working on a, a mural that is related to the tides and sea level in Provincetown, uh, trying to figure out how to depict where the water is, and you know the story of sea level is that is the story of the moon and the sun and the gravity and this entire astronomical system. So it's very complex, but uh, I won't go into that now. Uh, some of the references I mentioned and some early uh, both, uh, you know, it's, it's just, well, I'll just say that the top, t uh, or, or I'm sorry, the, uh, where's the other one? Uh, actually, well, the New English Canaan, I would pair with uh, the Bradford history, the Pilgrim history, because uh, English Canaan is written from the viewpoint of someone who was much more sympathetic that there was a human population here when he arrived. He was a trapper who married a native woman. And uh, he's the one that just the real information about how they uh, uh, tended the landscape, what agriculture was like, what their practices were. Uh, and I'll just close with that. Um, thank you. <laughs> not starting that because <laughs> um, my answer is really depressing so I want to go last so I don't just you know detonate right here <laughs> we're kind of close together yeah. All right, I'll <laughs> 
That'll be my non-entrance. Um. We can enunciate you. Are yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. I, w I will say that uh, in response to the question um, that live because I l I'm here, uh, the, the pandemic has driven a lot of people outside. It's a positive, I think. And um, this is why I think that we're lucky to be in touch with nature here on Cape Cod. Uh, um, my, my day included a lot more outdoor time, a lot more alone outdoor time. And so that's a plus. For me, um, I guess the biggest thing that I'm w that I'm fighting with all the time is um, my own whiteness and white silence and when I should talk and when I should let other people talk and uh, I happen to be judging the National Book Award right now in fiction and oh my God, like it's all I think about all the time. It's like who's, who's telling what story and so, so I guess, you know, I feel much more inclined for my writing to be political um, but I also want to be very careful about, about what I'm saying. If I'm saying shit I don't know about, you know what I mean? So I guess I would say I'm confounded and um, but not necessarily in a bad way by all of that. And, and that's really been true, not just from COVID, but from the election of Donald Trump and, um, and my own education teaching at the Institute of American Indian Arts in, in colonization, which, you know, not that I was like an idiot walking around before, but I've learned a great deal. So, so I guess I'm just trying to figure out what, what to write about, like what, you know, there's a lot of things that I would have written about in the past that now seem irrelevant. I guess I'll say that. But they probably aren't irrelevant. I just don't know how they're relevant. So I'm, I'm wrestling with all of that I in my current writing. Um, so I um, am. Yep, yeah, that's <laughs> it. I'm like, that's <laughs> it. Time's up. Um, so I, um, I don't. I haven't written so much because I have to work so many fucking jobs yeah. to pay rent in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, which is where I we lived when the pandemic hit. And as a single mom, <laughs> um, I just like lost all, all of my time. Like it was, it's been gone, and it's still gone. So um, I will say when I am writing, I read a lot more or differently. I think more intensely. Um, and I get really enmeshed with things <laughs> I read, which is good um, if I'm reading good stuff. But if I had to judge something again, I would not be able to stand it because there's also a lot of bullshit <laughs> out there. Anyway, okay, I, I'm okay. I am just gonna say um, that I do when I do write now, um, often on assignment only, <laughs> only on assignment. Um, I really enjoy that writer's high, like the high that you get from like when you're writing and you know you're writing something that has a life of its own that is not taking away your energy. <laughs> and so, I don't know, I'm looking for ways to like look for that high. And so now I'm gonna stop talking because that was a lot longer than 30 seconds. I'll, I'll say that the reading, I've read so many, you know, I, I had to put my hands on 520 books this summer, and and I read, except for the ones that were obviously put them down after two paragraphs, which there were some. Um, I I made a promise with myself that I was going to read 50 pages of all of them before I put them in the pile, and and now we're later in the process where we're we, we're down to 36 books and we're reading all of them ahead of us. I haven't used literature to evade the world <laughs> this much in decades, you know? <laughs> like I'm in those books and the books are, I mean, ha you know, 2022 is a weird draw for the National Book Awards because they were written in 2020. So half of them are apocalyptic, at least. I mean, I mean, in 
are all apocalyptic, but, but what I mean is near future after the thing. And there have been times when I've been holding a book in my hand and I've been like, I don't care if this is the best book of the year. I can't finish it. Like, it's too awful. But then, of course, I get over myself and I keep reading. But, like, this particular pile of books is so grim, like, so grim and true, you know, to what we're facing. And so, so it's not like I'm escaping with murder mysteries, I, it, it, but I'm... I'm living in literature this summer in a way that I haven't, and I hope it adds up to something in my own writing. Like, I, I hope I come out the other side of it, like, dying to write the kind of novel that I will then, in that imagined future, know something about <coughs> before I start. But, but it, it has been really beautiful to live this afternoon. I got to read a bunch of to go to sleep. Like, I'm reading that much. I'm reading a book a day. And I haven't done that since I was, like, 13, you know. And it's kind of wonderful. Are they more what? Are they Is that what they're writing about? Oh, yeah. The end of the fucking world. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I think they they under in a way that that my generation seems to fail to understand. I think they understand that you know they're if they were to like none of them are having children, for instance, because they know that their children wouldn't live to be fifty, you know, or whatever. Like I think they understand where we've left them much better than we do. Uh, that's what I. Think. You know, I'm so not the one to say whether there's hope. I, I think there's always hope, but I think hope is a thing that's separate from reality. <laughs> and art. And art. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would never be the one to say whether there's hope or not. It, it, you know, nobody knows the future. But I think the people who are 25 right now and who are conscious understand better than the people who are 60 right now, as a general rule, what we're – going into, you know, going into. And, and I mean, I think about Sherry Pepperton's book, uh, Erosion, mm -hmm. where she says, um, sorry. Sorry. Know me in my poker face. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your poker face. Um, that's how I think of it. Uh, anyway, she says, you know, that we, that we're so used to, and by we, of course, she means, you know, white Americans, right? But, but we're Mormons, probably. But we're so used to, like, going through the hard thing and getting to the other side and that there is no other side of this. So what matters is how we go into it. Like, how do we go into it? And I think that's a reality for the 20-somethings in a way that it's not for the 60-somethings because they are going to have to go into it and then they're going to have to live in it for however long. You know, as Katie Peterson says, it's not like the world's going to end on Tuesday, you know, like, <laughs> like if the world was going to end on Tuesday, like, that would be great. It's like, have a big party on Monday night. But the world's not going to end on Tuesday. The world's going to end in this slow, terrible way. And the world, the, the world is going to end. But our, our life as we are, have understood it, it's going to be a long, slow Life is pretty crappy all the time for most people <laughs> that are not white people in this world. Um, anyway, sorry to no, no, you just jump ahead. in there. No, That's it. That's all I want to say. Dude, white people cause the fucking thing. <laughs> like, so, I don't know. I talked to a, an earth scientist. 
somebody like you, uh, who is more yeah. of a scientist than you are, uh, maybe, um, who said, and maybe Allison, uh, I can't remember where this was or who it was, so I apologize for that, but he said, uh, talking about the future of the Earth, he said, well, the Earth, the future of the Earth looks terrible in the 100-year frame. Mm -hmm. But in the 500-year frame, it looks okay. He said there won't be hardly any people here, but the ones who are here will have learned a great deal. And we can hope that's true. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I mean, the end of the world is a ridiculous phrase, but the end of life as we have, as, as, as I have personally understood it, is certainly a threat. It's your turn to say something uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know, no, I, uh, I'm... I'm really drawn to the dystopian stories, um, and uh, um, and I don't know why uh, I'm drawn to them. You know, I I look at something like, you know, I apologize, this is a the wrong reference, but um, Station Eleven um, started as a series, and it's also a book, and I've written read several of her books now, and uh, I was something where eighty percent of humans die in the first weekend. You know, well that's not what we need right now, but. The story, I, once you get into the story, you realize this writer, this person has envisioned a story where they're going to carry me through it and I'm going to be taken care of in a way through, fiction can take care of you in a story, even if the story is kind of very uh, daunting and, and, and dangerous. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm impressed with writers who, you know, this is hard stuff, but I'm going to take you through it, and you need to come through it with me. You know, that's that's kind of what I look for. Why I look at dystopian stories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's certainly true about a lot of the books I've read. The ones that are worth it. This summer, it, there's a. Um, I mean, just to name one book. There's a book by she put in on a jet ski called How High We Go in the Dark. And it's a novel, it's a really a collection of books, I would say, but it says a novel on the cover. So, um, and it's the first chapter that scientists are in Siberia and they release the disease that, you know, is just, I just don't know, so fun. And, <laughs> and, and then in the second chapter, it's told by a clown at an amuse to park because this particular disease that they've released in Siberia kills children primarily. And so the CDC invented these amusement parks where you can bring your kid on his last day because the house is crowded and so they're just dying on the sidewalk outside the hospital. And you have a great day, cat and candy, and then you get on this roller coaster that goes with such details that the kids' brains are fried. And and honestly, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I, I just, I, aren't I making it, am I making it better yet? I like, I, I, I forget how much we like to party together. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly, I was listening to that in my car as I was driving past Taos when 350,000 acres were on fire. And and I just thought, I can't read this book. I can't, I, and you know, I, 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 I like the best. I was like, I can't read this book. And then I put it down. I actually put it sort of tentatively in the mail pile. And then I picked it up again. I was like, damn it, I, I gotta <laughs> read this book because I can't stop thinking about it. And so then I read some more chapters, which of course as the book goes on, I mean, it's not like things get better. <laughs> but, but it becomes about the way people ad adjust and the way people care for each other in certain ways and in certain ways not through these situations. Uh, and I just use that as one example. I'm not supposed to talk about the books that are like side books on the record, but <laughs> it's just one book that meant a lot to me in this whole process for just the reasons you're saying about like why we read, what dystopia is doing. And, you know, when, I mean, honestly, I mean, just to, you know, when you think about how much discussion in that little window of time, of the colonization time that was on your screen just a few minutes ago, you know, Alaska, you know, all the salmon, and like since statehood, since statehood, we 
killed all the salmon, you know, to, because we can't stop ourselves, you know. And all of that's real, you know. It's real what we've done. It's real what the colonizers have done to the earth. We, and, and, and if you're not thinking about that every day, I don't mean to the exclusion of everything else you think about, but if that's not in your consciousness, I, I don't even know how you're getting by. Because for me, like, I, I feel that as penance, and it's important for me to feel that. It's important to me to feel crushed by that as one of the many, many things I feel as I move through my day in the world, you know? I, I agree. And um, the, the only reason I brought up Station Eleven, though, is that in the, in the, as, it, as the narrative unfolds and everything is sort of gone, the one thing that survives is storytelling, theater, art. And I've never really read a book that re nude my faith in art to uh, make white life worthwhile. Um, n not that it, it not might not necessarily heal anything, but um, yeah, anyway. Um. Yeah, it, yeah, I mean, that's sort of where I started with like my weird summer of living with that book. It, it has been a place to, to not be in denial, you know? <laughs> The books I have written this summer have been a way to not be in denial, but also to see the complicatedness of where we are and what we've done. Well, that was heavy. <laughs> <laughs> That might be a good <laughs> <laughs>